Suppose I had a piece of the beta globin gene here. If I melt this gene, if I denature this double stranded piece of DNA, I'm going to denature it, heat it up, 97 degrees C, melts the strands. That's what I did before for sequencing, right? I melted it and I added a primer. Let me also add a primer matching the other end. How do I know the sequence at both ends? Well, I've already sequenced your beta globin gene, so I know the sequence. So I can actually just make a primer matching it, because I know the whole sequence. Now if I add polymerase, and I add DNTPs, not dideoxys now, perfectly good, not defective, what's going to happen? It's just going to go and what have I got now? I've replicated the strands. Where I once had a single double helix, I now have two. One copy, two copies. Any guess of what we should do next? Four copies. What we're going to do is we now have two, so if we melt that, we're going to get four single strands. Now let's get it right. We're going three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime. We're going to put a primer over here. We're going to put a primer over there. We're going to put a primer over here. We're going to put a primer over there. And what's going to happen? We will add our polymerase and our nucleotides and whoop, now, how many copies do we have? Four. We have four copies. Uh, what's the pattern? It doubles every time. If I do this another round, I have eight. If I do it 30 times, I have how many? Two to the 30th. 2 to the 30th is approximately, what's 2 to the 10th? It's about 1,000. In, 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 in computer science, it's 1024. In biology, it's 1,000, um, give or take, right? We, we round things off here. So 2 to the 10th is 1,000. I know it's 1024. It's OK. It's about 1,000. So what's 2 to the 20th? 1,000 times 1,000, which would be a million. And you have MIT here. Come on, guys, come on. <laughs> 2 to the 30th? A billion. In other words, if I just repeat this 30 times, I just do 30 rounds, 30 cycles of this, I get 2 to the 30th copies, or in other words, about 1 billion copies. That is pretty amazing. If I knew the sequence of your beta globin gene and I made primers for each end, I could take that fragment of DNA. And by doing that, I can get a billion copies from a single copy. Yes? Are there any corrections on machine redoing? So wouldn't the most of those be wrong that done? Slightly. <laughs> They'd be slightly wrong, but in random places. And when I sequence the whole gamish, the right ones would far dominate the wrong ones. I can tolerate a little bit of error rate. I'm not trying to run an organism. I'm just trying to do a sequencing reaction. So it turns out that polymerase will get it wrong occasionally. but you know, it's a fairly low rate, and I'm doing a sequencing reaction, and a couple little errors, you know, like one molecule in 10 to the fifth being wrong won't bother me at all on my sequencing. Yes? Oh, if it happened in the second go, the odds are, oh, if I started with a single molecule, that would be a problem. But what if I'm starting with like many molecules? Suppose I start with 1,000 molecules. Then I'm OK. But you're right. If I'm starting with a single molecule, I could be unlucky and have an early error. And therefore, and that's an issue if I'm doing a single molecule. But usually, so where am I going to apply this PCR reaction? Well, in fact, I was talking about it as if that was your fragment of beta globin. But actually, what I'm going to do is just take his total DNA. I'm going to take your total DNA, all of it, 
and I'm going to add, uh, not, not all of it, I mean, but, but like from some cells. <laughs> you can keep most of it, all right? But I'm going to ask you to give me a few cells, maybe, maybe like a little mill of blood or something like that. And from it, I'm going to purify DNA. And then I'm going to just mix the primers right in. And I'm going to heat up your total chromosomal DNA, all your genomic DNA there. And, I'm gonna, and the primers, as it cools down, will go around and find their right spot in the genome by Crick-Watson base pairing and sit down. And when I add polymerase, it'll copy. When I then heat it up and cool it down, those primers will do it again. And in fact, if I do this not on a single cloned piece of DNA, but just on total genomic DNA from you, I will be able to amplify your beta globin gene. In fact, if everybody, I don't need much. If we got a popsicle stick and we scrape the inside of your, your cheek a little bit, I'd get enough buckle cells off the inside of your cheek that if I tossed it in a test tube, and I just boiled it. I'm not going to do anything fancy. There's enough DNA in that test tube that if I add the primers from her beta globin gene, it'll amplify your beta globin gene, even in the midst of the entire rest of your human genome. And whereas the beta globin gene starts out being a tiny fraction of the genome, after I make a billion copies of it, it's the vast majority of what's in the test tube. That's your beta globin gene. I can get everybody here to, to spit in a test tube, add primers and do this, and get everybody's beta globin gene once I know one beta globin gene. That is way cool. That was worth a Nobel Prize. Now, a couple little tricks. <sighs> when I heat this up to 97 degrees, I put, this, I put my DNA in here. I heat it up to 97 degrees to melt it. I add my DNA polymerase. It does one cycle. And then I heat it up to 97 degrees again and it destroys my polymerase. So I have to open up the test tube, and I have to add more polymerase. Then I do another cycle. Then I heat it up to 97 degrees, and it destroys my polymerase, and I have to open up the test tube and add more. <sighs> this gets boring. So maybe, yes? Could you find an organism that lives at ni around 97 degrees Celsius and steal its DNA polymerase? Oh, now we're getting into it. We're not even going to the engineering department and say, get me a polymerase that can work at 97 degrees, because you know it's ask the expert, which is almost always a bacterium. There's got to be some bacterium that lives at 97 degrees, and its polymerase won't denature. Where could you find a bacterium that lives at 97 degrees? That's virtually boiling water in a hot springs, in a geyser. So people went and got bacteria that live in boiling water. In fact, the bacterium they got is a bacterium, the bacteria that has the name Thermus aquaticus. Meaning, what's that mean? Hot water. Yeah. Thermus aquaticus. Lives in a hot spring. Uh, we just call it now TAC, T-A-Q, Thermus aquaticus. And if you use TAC polymerase, I don't have to keep opening up the test tube because I throw in TAC polymerase and it doesn't denature. Now, in ancient days, I have to also move my test tube between different water baths. But you can imagine that from the point of view of engineering, it's not hard to put it in a machine that just goes hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Mm -hmm. Yes, question? Um, but if a TAC um, lives at 97 degrees, won't its DNA not stay together? Oh, we just purify TAC's polymerase. We get rid of TAC. Yeah, but in the TAC, like when it's alive, yep. does it, like how does its DNA stay together? What a cool question. What a cool question. How does TAC's DNA stay together? I'm not going to address it now, but it's a really good question. For an organism that lives in, at 97 degrees, is there going to be something that holds it together? Are there going to be some proteins that hold it together? Would you imagine it would have more G's and C's or A's and T's? G's. Why G's and C's? Three hydrogen. Three hydrogen bonds. Tax genome has a lot of G's and C's in it, for example. There are some tricks that you, but let's hold off on it. But it's a great question. Why does its genome stay together? But at the moment, we're just stealing its polymerase. How it managed to keep its genome together at 97 degrees is, frankly, its problem right now, right? <laughs> we're, we're simply raiders of the genome here. We've raided the organism's polymerase. And so you add TAC polymerase, 
And we've got, I don't know, here's a thermocycler. It's got 96 little holes here. You put up, you see 96, 8 by 12, told you. You put a little plate in there, and you can, or, or you put tubes, actually. This one's got tubes. And you put little, little, little tubes there, and you go heat, cold, heat, cold, heat, cold, cold. And when you're done, you have a billion times more copy of whatever you put the primers in for. Pretty cool. Now, how sensitive is this? Just how sensitive is, is, is uh, PCR? I could scrape the inside of your cheek there with the popsicle stick and get enough cells to do it. But how few cells could I use? How few cells could I use? The limiting case would be one. How many copies of the beta globin gene are there in a single cell? Well, two, right? Because we're diploids. So suppose we really wanted to show off. Let's use a haploid cell. What's the most convenient haploid cell to get? No, human. Gamete. Which would you prefer, male or female gamete here? Male gamete would be more convenient in this case, right? <laughs> so we get a single sperm. I mean, you can get single eggs, but it's like, it's a lot more fuss, right? <laughs> so we're going to use a single sperm. You can put single sperm in a test tube and do a PCR reaction. And you can amplify a billion copies from a single sperm. It's pretty cool. You can do single, single cell sensitivity. A sperm. <laughs> you can use PCR. Actually, when people do in vitro fertilization, and they fertilize an egg in vitro, and they grow it up to the 8 or 16 cell stage. And they want to find out whether this embryo is carrying a particular genetic disease where we know the mutation. You can pull off one of the cells from the embryo that has been grown in the dish. And it turns out that the 8 and 16 cell stage, the cells haven't specified yet. If you pull one off, the, the cell mass will still regulate and produce a perfectly normal baby there. You can pull one of those cells off and do a PCR reaction and check whether it has the genetic disease or not. And this is how some people are able, couples who are at risk for a genetic disease, can do in vitro fertilization and reimplant only those embryos that don't carry the genetic disease because they pull off single cells from each, do PCR and sequencing, and figure out whether they carry the mutation. Powerful technology. You can do this to monitor the presence of HIV in somebody's blood. Get some blood, do PCR with primers against HIV. Monitor bacterial infections. Get some blood, get some urine, do something. Monitor by PCR the presence of the bacteria. You can do this to monitor whether a cancer chemotherapy is working. If you know some mutations that occur in the cancer, you can do PCR there and see if you get any pieces of DNA that are characteristic of the cancer cells as opposed to the normal cells. You can use this for Forensics, lick the back of a letter, enough DNA comes off that the guys on CSI and Law and, Law and Order can do PCR on the back of the letter and amplify DNA. It's a very powerful technology. And what it is, is cloning without cloning. We went all to all the work of making this library and finding our gene once, but we're then rewarded by being able to get that particular gene out of every other member of the species. And that's extremely powerful. We'll stop there and pick up again on recombinant DNA and its applications next time. PCR is a pretty cool technique. To be sure you understand how it works, try this question.